found out that Office World were about to launch their e-commerce website. Let's get to them. We can help them with a campaign or whatever, you know. So he managed to get a meeting. Very money only lives an hour away. He got so lost, he turned up to the meeting an hour and a half late, and they still saw him. So anyway, he got this meeting. It seemed to go well. Got another meeting to go back and present ideas. I remember him and I sitting in the little chef, having a cup of tea and sharing a toasted tea cake, saying, we're going to have to go in and win something here. Otherwise, one of us is going to have to go and get a job. When you're able to look back at your journey and some of the dots start connecting to where you are now, if you look back in your journey, where do those dots start to begin? Where did it start to take place, would you say? I think that, I don't know, for me it was... Everything I said to my mum when I was 13, like, yeah. I need to own my own business, I can't work for anybody. I have no reference points for entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. like none. So I don't know where that came, it was something about, I kind of need to be in control of the process or something like that. Yeah. It, 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 it came from, I don't know whether it's because I, yeah, I've gone record saying I had my first job when I was 10. It was 10. It was about to begin. I mean, to it's, it's, to a certain extent, it would be like the health and safety of your woman looking at you now going, not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. Because, you know, I'm up there, you know, up in a dairy. And what, was the, what was the job? I was delivering milk on a Saturday and Sunday. Oh, and then in the holidays as well. Um, so, you know, like leaping, you know, 10 years old, leaping off milk carts, <laughs> like sort of in the roads. You, you wouldn't be allowed to do it now, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I think that. I, that bit about, oh, okay, I can, to a certain extent, I can take control of how much I earn. Mm. And then did you have, like, anyone in your area that you kind of looked up to, like another person with a business or the owner of the dairy? No, I guess it was like Express Dairy as a corporation, but mm -hmm. I, I suppose the first point it, it came with my mate was earning more money mm -hmm. than the pocket money I was getting by some margin. Yeah. And so I said, how do you go about that? Okay, and did he introduce you to his like? Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, I had you know, how do I get a job like that? So, yeah. So that 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 was pretty good. So I suppose that 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 first bit of how do you what what does control mean and how do you am oh, I now I'm working for somebody. Mm -hmm. but I can't imagine where else that original thought about I've got to run my own business came from. Got it. Like maybe I'd read something. And there were a few things came together, but evidently I was thirty when I said it. I'm not sure I remember saying it, but I'm reminded that I did say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the first point, I think. Did that manifest itself through, like, school as well, as well in the sense of, like, the way we're taught in schools is, like, to get a job and the way we're even just, like, educated is a bit like there's not much creativity or much freedom around that. Um, did you start rebelling in that sense or, like, start going off your own little path? I managed to get through... O levels or what now, GCSEs. Yeah. Not because I did any work, just because I had a memory and I could remember enough from the first time I, I looked at it to be able to pass an exam. Not well, because mm -hmm. my grades were, by any standard, barely passable. <laughs> Apart from English, I did well in English. Yeah. Because it was about creativity and I could do that. I could do the creative writing bit. But apart from that, oh well. You couldn't, you wouldn't describe me as a great student. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. So at what point did you have an idea or start thinking about like what you wanted to do when you were older? I left school at 16 and went to work in a camera shop. Mm -hmm. Which is good. I was working with a load of like mad Australians for South Africans had a really good time. Yeah. But I always had, I'd always sort of promised my mum at some, like, I, I would go back, I would find something to study. Mm -hmm. And so I went, I went and did a BTEC in business mm -hmm. down in Stepney Green. Nice. Just off the commercial road. I'm sitting in East London College. And there I met a group of every, just about every teacher there really got you engaged in their subject. And it all of a sudden made sense rather than going, Here's a textbook, write notes. Mm. They'd bring someone in from an ad agency and say, here's a product. This is how you make an ad campaign. I'm going away for two weeks. When I come back, you've got to do a presentation about your ad campaign. 
for this product. Mm -hmm. And then you went, you know, did that for lots of different subjects. And so it was a kind of that, the practicality of that and that, that, that I could see that in the things that I see around me and the, as the jobs that I could potentially do mm -hmm. kind of made sense. Got it. So I have something to do with creativity. Um, was pitching in your mind, like in terms of building relationships or sales as well? Yeah, and then just business. Just business in general. What is a business? Yeah. Rather than, you know, my slightly hustly sort of like get another tenor kind of way. This is how, you know, business is constructed from finances and, and you know, this is how, this is a good one and this is a bad one and, and those kind of things. I, you know, of course, at a pretty rudimentary level mm -hmm. to get you through a BTEC, but, but practical. Yeah. And so that kind of made sense. And so after that, I went and did a business degree. My, my degree was four years. Mm -hmm. So the third year was in industry. Got it. So you had to go, you had to apply for what was essentially a proper job, you know, a year. Somebody's just got to take a student for a year. And so I, I got a job at Vitti's Biscuits. Nice. No, that's United Biscuits now, right? Yeah. yeah. It was United Biscuits at the time, mm. but they, they had snacks and frozen foods. And I went to work for the biscuit division. Nice. They a lot. And it was a great training ground. It was really good. When I finished at the end of that year, before I went back to uni, they offered me a job. Mm. Come back afterwards. Yeah. So that, you know. Takes all the pressure off. Path of least resistance. <laughs> and I had a great time. I worked with amazing, really, really good people there. Yeah, yeah. Who, who, and I, I felt they, like and if, if you've got people who you feel are looking out for you, and who, you know, who want the best for you and, and want to help, you develop yes. that it was that kind of environment i love that i love that i feel like it's important especially when someone comes in fresh as a grad to give them as much exposure and as much chances to do what they need to do so they can develop like when people are quite protective over the way they develop their um like direct reports it's a bit strange to me because i feel if you develop them they get better you have less things to do and you can focus on more interesting things and you look great as a leader um, but some people are very territorial when it comes to development, which I find quite strange. I think it's it's one of the most durable things about any bit anything in business for me. Yeah, in the end is is what you can help the people that come through and you can help them achieve. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, a lot of the people who work with me have gone on way more amazing things than I've I, I've been capable of, and just that little bit of the journey where you get to help. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. So with, how long were you at United Biscuits for when you came back? So I went back and then I was there initially for about a year and a half. And then I sold them on the idea that I should get sent to Japan. Explain that. How you done the business case? It's, it's, it's one of those ridiculous things of you have to ask because you never know. Because the answer might just be yes. Yeah. So I'd always had an interest in Japan when we were growing up. We had Japanese students staying in the house. So I'd always had, and my mum's great keeping in touch. So we always used to get parcels to Japan every year. And I was a bit fascinated. It's an interesting place of, you know, if you're looking from afar, it was always me growing up. It's the most modern place in the world. And I toured Japan on my own when I was 20, 22. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing, fascinating place. And I saw an advert. My sister's boyfriend had left a Sunday newspaper around. And I'm just, just flicking through, I think, part or section. There's this advert for this program run by the European Commission called the Executive Training Program for Japan, mm -hmm. where you could get sponsored by the European Commission as a job to learn Japanese. You could actually get paid a salary to go to Japan learn Japanese and study Japanese business culture. And so I took that advert, I photocopied it, and I faxed it. Talk about the time, <laughs> that, that was, how long ago that was. I faxed it to the director of who looked after Japan, who was based in Hong Kong. Had you met him before? No. So no one, do you get any... I tried some communication with him when somebody, I think one of his people, was calling our you know, faxed our office or needed something from the UK office and I got involved in sending it back. Mm -hmm. And I just I faxed him just with the advert and the words 
that Simon, I think this sounds like a good idea. What do you think? In fact, swinging back and says, yeah, and that sounds really interesting. But that wasn't even the most ridiculous bit about it. I mean, of course, you know, the fact that somebody would say yes to somebody who's never heard of is a junior in a UK office. But it just so just happened that the managing director of the UK business was a German guy called Hartwig Konzelman. I'll never forget his name. Because it wasn't for him, I would never have been sent. And the reason that he was so interested in me doing it, I was applying for ETP 15, Executive Training Program 15. He had been on the original selection committee for ETP 1. So the very, so this guy who'd been appointed to this position 15, 14, 15 years later, I had no idea of the connection. He saw what I wanted to do. He was a massive supporter of this program and he, and he said, yeah, you have to go. Wow. And I had no idea that he had anything to do with it. That's and if he time. hadn't got that job, like in the year before, me asking for that, I'm sure they wouldn't have sent. Yeah. Timing is everything. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Even taking your shots as well. Like you could um and R about what's the best way to send this back. Be <laughs> like, can I do this? <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I, I think back now and I think I, I slightly cringe at the same time that that it, it, looking back, I can look at it slightly as arrogance and think, but at the same time, you know, don't ask. You don't get. It's not possible. Yeah. You're there for a year or just over? Japan, I was there for nearly three years. Nearly three years? Okay. So I stayed and I was involved in kind of the first stages of helping to set up a subsidiary, new subsidiary in Japan. Wow. So you would have been 25 at the time? 24. So I, when I left to go to Japan, when I was still, I got there just as I turned 25. Okay. How did you feel about handling that much responsibility? going over there because I mean at the beginning you were just going there for vibes and learn the language <laughs> now you're setting up the business well yeah but I think I'd been easy having been trained in Japanese language and culture yeah um it it just was I think that it just feels like part of the next step I think I'm far more daunted by things these days because you know they call it the arrogance of youth or whatever I just you know, less fear yeah and just take the next step and see what happens mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then transitioning back to the uk after that was it quite easy uh yeah because i, th I think you, you know you just move on right my my wife's because my wife and i've been together nearly 30 years we went out there together okay but her mom got sick so um th i think that was one of the th one of the things drawing us back but also i mean I felt like I'd, you know, I'd done my Japan bit and I didn't want to... I'm not sure I wanted to become a Japan specialist. I loved it. Yeah. I still do. I think it's amazing. And I look back at that time, it was an incredible experience. But I didn't think I wanted to become a Japan specialist. Okay. So it kept, felt quite easy to come home, actually. So when you came back, it was right time in. Um, you're still with United Biscuits or...? Came back, got a job with ICI. Mm -hmm. Kind of in sales at a part of marketing. But I kind of had... because. The internet had been kicking off while I was there and I was like, trying to find anything to do with websites and that's where I kind of got a bit involved in doing the new website project. It was there that I met a leadership coach who changed my perspective on stuff. Who was it? So she said pretty much, so they got people in to train and see, you know, how you can develop and, and this lady, she said, you can't stay here. So you have to, you have to find that, that combination of, business and technology that fascinates you. You've got, till you do that, you won't. Feel fulfilled. Yeah. How did they get to that type of conversation with the leadership coach? Because well, she, she was there, she was there, she quizzed us mm -hmm. over a series of sessions about, you know, what, what interests us and what we want to do. And, um, and she just, she was just really, her name was Francesca Talevi. Mm -hmm. I pinged her a few years ago. Yeah. Just to say thank you. Same, because if it, I'm just might not have taken kind of the next step yeah 
So how did you think about taking the next step? A friend approached me and said, this internet thing's going on, yeah. I'm working for an incubator, they need someone to come and run a company. What's that? Yeah. I'm off. Yeah, great. Didn't even really understand the company <laughs> or what I was meant to be doing. Yeah. But they thought I could do it. I didn't have any clue what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of that's where my internet, you know, I started off running a business for somebody else. Mm-hmm. Learned some of what not to do there. Learned some of what to do. Um, started to get something going, but we ended up building a bit of a business that they weren't, they wanted something scalable. And it was just, I mean, I joined them three months after the NASDAQ crashed. Oh, wow. So, like all the funding and this all gone. So, like evaporated. Mm-hmm. And so we were kind of like sitting around scratching our heads. I had one business that was quite successful relatively at those times. I mean, at least it was still going. And I, um, I inflated it on a And then so we, you know, two of us, two or three of us there and said, well, let's get together and we're going to build another. Why don't we, we could build something. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was the first step. Wow. End of 2002. It was university. So that's when you guys built the agency. Yeah. Blue Barracuda. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you think about making an agency then? Um, didn't. <laughs> I, don't th- I don't think I knew it was going to be an agency. I didn't know, I didn't know the difference yeah. between a services business and a, and something that scales with me. I, d- I had no, I didn't understand that. Mm. Would I, th- I think we thought we would, because it was to do with the internet and technology and we might build some tech. I think I thought it was a technology business. Yeah. It was only probably a few years in where I'd made an enormous number of mistakes and understood a few more things that, that I understood it wasn't. Although we were very involved in technology and we had coders and everything, but it wasn't. But we were too, you know, would I have changed at that point? Yes, I think we probably thought about, well, can we create a product out of this? And we did try a couple of times, but half-heartedly. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're just too busy. And it just, you know, it scaled relatively quickly. Yeah, yeah. Because how did you get your first clients, though? If you can remember. Yeah, oh, yeah, I can. Our first client, proper client, was Office World. If you want a story about how not to start. Yes. <laughs> so my business partner, Martin, who is wonderful, super smart, way smarter than me, but doesn't have the greatest sense of direction in the world. Found out that Office World were about to launch their e-commerce website and think, right, we'll do a camp. We can, let's get to them. We can help them with a campaign or whatever, you know, little things we're doing. Some of the stuff that we've been trialing at the incubator. Mm-hmm. You know, can, so he managed to get a meeting. Very money only lives an hour away from where their office is in, was in Milton Keynes. He got so lost, he turned up to the meeting an hour and a half late. Right. And they still saw him. How? <laughs> Tom, you know, oh, sorry. And, I mean, this is the most ridiculous thing about, if you know Milton Keynes, it's based on a grid system. Mm-hmm. So, like, just ups, downs, lefts, and rights. I didn't know that. <laughs> so, so, anyway, he got this meeting. It seemed to go well. Got another meeting to go back and present ideas. Mm-hmm. I remember him him and I sitting in the little chef, sharing a cup, having a cup of tea and sharing a toasted tea cake, saying, we're going to have to go in and win something here. Otherwise, one of us is going to have to go and get a job. Because we were kind of like, we've been trying to win business. And well, certainly, I was still kind of partly, you know, doing something else. And he was kind of like throwing himself in. Mm-hmm. And we went in. Print the ideas, seemed to go well. And we thought we were pitching for a campaign, just one campaign, just get us going, anything, you know. And they um, they phoned us up a few week, few days, a week later, and said, you've won, you won on the business. It's great, we'll, we'll do a campaign. Then this weird thing happened. So they kept phoning us up and emailing us with all this other stuff. And it turns out that they thought we were pitching for all of their business, not just a campaign. Okay. How did that get mistaken? If Martin can turn up an hour and a half late for a meeting, you know, neither of us knew. And I think it's probably a good thing that we didn't know because if we'd have known, I think we'd have been 
bearing in mind where we were at at the point at that time, yeah, I think we'd have been way too nervous. Those us just going for one little thing and it ended up giving the whole pack. And so taking on all of that business, it wasn't daunting to begin with. It didn't feel it. I think. I think I. I don't think it felt it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it seems the world of the possible. We just, you know, give us an out, we'll get our heads around it, kind of stuff. <laughs> and it, I think that most people were in that position at, at that time, mm. right? There were a few people who knew what they were doing, but I think most people, yeah, really, yeah. I think especially when something like that is so new, because you, you said they're a new e-commerce website, right? I think they're just open to people who can make it happen. Um, and I think being a small team, you have the advantage of like speed efficiency you've got the history the background um it probably just ticked a lot of boxes for them as well not for sure yeah yeah so your first product was that um or first service rather was that putting people to have their own e-commerce website or were you we didn't even do no somebody else they did the website i think internally with a little bit of external resource and we just helped grow the sales and how were you doing internally in terms of like building the, building up your team i think we so we had one person who come with us from the last place and there were the, the founders mm-hmm. and, uh, and we just got on and eventually you, you know you go oh, we, need, we could have to do with somebody to do this and you know it just it kind of just grew from there nice just roll with the punches love <laughs> sharing somebody else's office got a first office in town in a basement yeah like rats running like around outside <laughs> step by step by step by step where was this that was in Mayfair well, I'm not, you know what? I'm not surprised. The we were in a nice place and, <laughs> you know, this like rickety old thing that we did up with a big poster from Ikea and a lick of paint and some desks. Yeah. And and that was it. That's a, that's a good beginning. Humble beginnings. Yeah. It would, I mean, it was just <laughs> some of the offices we had. I mean, the worst office we had was the next one we had an office on the Strand. Mm-hmm. And the worst bit about that is the toilet had no heating at all. So we were always scared if clients really wanted to come to the office and meet us in in December. Yeah. Who so think you can't, you know, they should get the to a loo that's basically had ice on the inside of the window. <laughs> Just freeze. <laughs> so you guys would would you do want to treat yourself to like a another like bigger office or better place? You're just trying to keep costs low. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Just the, the an office that's good enough for, for the people we had for us and the people to go to mm-hmm. that was I think you, you end up with the office that's equally, because we were all select, this fan spread all over the place. So it, it was somewhere that was equally in, in, inconvenient to everybody. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And at the centre of town, we thought, well, you know, we can get, if we interview someone, mm-hmm. and then we're in the centre, at least, you know. Yeah, and, and I think, like, even having, Good connect, like, having places like Mayfair, Strand, as your address, it signals, like, you guys know what you're doing as well. A little bit. <laughs> Until you <laughs> well, the office. <laughs> Like, yeah, we're just here for temporarily. <laughs> it's just why the office is getting renovated. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, the, our first time when we had the office in, uh, it was a machine office in Lechworth. Mm. That was the very first office. We would like to two desks. We used to pretend that all the other people in the office were ours. Yeah. They're walking in. Oh, yeah, yeah, Kathy, can you, yeah, like that, right? We didn't know. Can you a coffee? We, I don't think we would have said, or we would have had, <laughs> you know, the balls to say anything. It was just, it was just, they're there. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they must assume that they're out. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> oh, cool. And then growing the business in itself, like, did you always have an idea of where you wanted to take it to or what, like, exiting would be? No? I don't think so. Um, we just wanted to win good clients mm-hmm. and, and, and grow the business, get more opportunities. Yeah. Grow the profit. We made every, like, classical cash flow mistake and hiring mistake and that it's possible to make. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Talking about them growing the business because with like agency models, um, you said you've done it in a scalable way. Well, we, we, I mean, I think the biggest year we had of growth in people was probably 30 odd in a year. That's quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, it felt, it definitely felt a lot. Yeah. That was, it was maybe even a bit too fast because we definitely made some mishires in that time. Yeah. Um, but that was probably the biggest single year of growth. How were you able to keep cohesion with so much change? Probably only just mm-hmm. at times. I mean, I, th- I always hoped that it was always, you know, we provided a good opportunity to people, 
place to work. But there's a lot. There's a lot of, you know, people move around in agent in the agency game. And, and, you know, it's a time of great growth. So people, people always, if you're if you're starting to build a name for yourself, people come and poach. Oh, like that. Yeah. And as you were growing, what did you discover was like the secret sauce of Blue Barracuda? Like, why you were able to keep getting your clients, people coming in? Um, I've got results for people. Yeah. You know, we did what we said. We solved problems. I think we weren't ever, we weren't really trying to sell anything as such. Certainly in those early days when we, we built it, it was we, we were people who could provide solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we were quite creative, not necessarily in a design sense, but in a problem solving sense. Mm. What kind of problems were you solving? Um, just in approaches to projects. Mm -hmm. You know, how, I mean, you know, we, we redid all of, I mean, when we're from a t that tiny little office in Mayfair, we, we won the business to redo the whole of BAA's website. So he threw out a Gatway, all of that stuff. That is massive. It was mad. I mean, we didn't do the, the technical behind the scenes stuff, but everything about how they, Ooh, yeah. put, how they all linked together, all of that stuff we did. Because mm -hmm. how, how does a normal pitching process go with agencies? Like, do they send out the RFP, the request for proposal, and everyone kind of tenders for that? Or is there more of an informal way whereby if you know someone and know someone and knows that a contract that stuff. came, I think, because somebody introduced us to somebody there. Yeah. If I remember rightly. I don't, I don't think we were ever very good at the formal, certainly in those early days. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we were so good at the slightly more formal stuff mm -hmm. because we weren't from the agency game, so we didn't really understand it. Mm -hmm. And kind of, it was much more about us just reaching out and making connections, making whatever network we had at that point work. Mm. And not being from the agency game, do you think that actually helped you instead of hindered? They're both. Yeah. You know, I think I was speaking, we spent years trying to turn, hiring designers who wanted to be designers and calling them art directors and then not really understanding how creative teams work in agencies. Explain that to me. Well, because creative teams in the ad world, they're made up of a copywriter, somebody who comes up with the words and somebody who designs that. We didn't understand, I doubt, we didn't understand how that worked. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, I mean, we should have probably done better at if we work in that industry, the questions, but I think that that probably helped us because it allowed us to be sometimes not so formulaic in how we came up with solutions to problems. I think we probably were pitching more for growth and, you know, internet projects, which involve technology and a bit of design and a bit of growth and and marketing rather than straight advertising I would say got it so it's like hinging or not hinging but like looking at where the momentum is going just on a whole in the industry which is the internet yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah knowing that okay we're good at marketing we're good at advertising we've got amazing designers here and then attaching that to a solution because well the problem at that time was everyone wants to be online and everyone has the best like online presence right yeah and so then coming in to do that for them and some of the work was if we would begin, we might snap off a piece, yeah, a piece of particular piece of work around. Did a lot of work for eBay around building up trust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At the time we're going, Phew, you know, where is this stuff coming from? How do you, you know, that there are people behind the platform that you try. It? So, so we bits of work like that. Yeah. Um. So you know, just depending on what we came across. Mm. Doing a B two B business, like how was that for you? Because um, sometimes B two C is more sexy, but B two B makes more money. And coming from a corporate background, I guess it's easier to assimilate into like the B two B world potentially. Yeah, no, and to a certain extent, we were working on with brands on consumer campaigns. Mm. So we, I felt we got connected to something that might appear to be slightly sexier. Yeah, um, and so there were some interesting bits around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it just it kind of just grew very organically. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't think we really had a clue in the first place what we were getting into or what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. It just, we tried different things um, and kind of went from, went from there. But, I mean, you know, we had a couple of really tough existential moments. Yeah, anything you don't want to go for? I just, you know, not watching the cash properly. Yeah. Like doing things like big CapEx project, 
I'm making loads of profit. You're going, <laughs> wait a minute, who's looking at the cash? <laughs> that, that gets quite interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, did you have an FD with you, or were you guys were just like still going with it? We had a financial controller, but we'd kind of been like playing a bit fast and loose, and she was trying to like <laughs> pull all the bits together. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was, I mean, she's still my accountant today. Oh, wow. It's fantastic. That's pretty cool. That is good. That's the, you know she's doing a great job. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. And she's really good at telling me off. <laughs> you need an account. You need that. that. You need that. You need that. So when we came to the exit, how did that come about? Were you guys looking for a buyer or it just came organically as well? We were, you always have conversations. Yeah. Um, we had lost one of our business partners to cancer. Okay. In, in, Jason died 2010. And so we were a little bit, well, uh, you know, how do we feel about this? He was a bit of an emotional, you know, support. Mm. Certainly, you know, certainly for me, I felt, I felt, you know, losing him quite keenly. I mean, I, I, I left my other business partners, one of them is still my business partner today. Um, but he was, he'd been quite an important person. And I think when an approach came, we got approached um, by somebody who was operating for a, a buyer. Yeah. Saying, well, look, we're looking for just your kind of business. So we, I'd, had we been looking to sell, I think maybe in the back of our minds after losing Jason, <laughs> um, it probably seemed like the right time, yeah. um, at least subconsciously. Yeah. And then when the approach came, it, it kind of felt quite well mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's interesting because... Um, there's a part of you that might want to keep it, like the whole legacy argument and the rest of it. Um, but you just felt at the right time to make that transition. Yeah. 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 Was it an easy sell? Well, one of my business partners had previously been an M&A lawyer. Okay. Oof. Come in handy. Yeah. So he said, look, I can do, you guys run the business and I'll go and do this. Mm -hmm. So he took care of everything? He pretty much ran the, the whole process. Yeah. But I have to give him enormous credit right before you didn't press. <laughs> I mean, I think it was a good deal for everybody, but mm. um, I didn't really have to think about it much. Mm. He just took it, knew what to do, did it. We had a bit, we had somebody come in a few days, a really good yeah. advisor, just to help us, you know, with some of the nuances of, because he'd been an M&A guy, but not necessarily in the agency world. So mm -hmm. I had a bit of extra advice off the side, but um, yeah, he ran that process while we kept the business going. That's awesome. How do you even keep the business going when you're talking to clients? They don't know what's happening in the, in the back. No, 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 no. Yeah. Because you don't, I mean, until, until there's ink on the page, it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not happening yet. So on, so it can be, you know, these processes can go forever. They can go south really quick. Mm -hmm. Dealing with large companies, what's going on there, depending on how their results are going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it can it can change. You never you're never done till you're done. No, and especially when it can hinge on just one person, and then it's 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 weird. Like you can have ego, which can push you in the way to get the deal done, but there's also ego if someone just doesn't want to spend money or they're battling over like say half a million. Which in the grand scheme of like say a twenty million dollar deal is like it's nothing, but someone wants to kind of what's the word, like, show show who's boss <laughs> and keep negotiation of price down. Well, the final sign-off was goes to some, you know, exec committee in New York. Exactly. Have they all had their coffee that morning? Did they feel good? Yeah. Maybe one of their kids was being really annoying that day. You know, <laughs> who, who knows what, what plays into those, those signs. I mean, you hope that everyone's done the work to prepare everybody and they're just ticking boxes, but... I don't know. Mm. You, if, you, if you're not in those places in those rooms, you wouldn't know that at all. Oof. Yeah, I don't know. So when when that whole journey was going through, like with um, Blue Barracuda, like what would you say was some of the most like the most memorable campaign that you did, which you were most proud of? The, I think the thing we were most known for at the time is we we did the whole project to sell the first ever Pizza Hut pizza online in Europe. So we put the whole project cool. together. Yeah. End to end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we worked with um, some friends of ours who like were hardcore integration specialists to integrate with all the till systems mm -hmm. and then everything else. We worked with the Pizza Hut, put the whole thing together, got it online. That's pretty cool. 
was yeah. good. And they were great people to deal with at the, at the client side as well. Mm -hmm. You should have pizza for life for free now. <laughs> Literally, you should have that. I, funny enough, I, just, I, didn't, yeah, I couldn't think to put that in the contract. I really should have. You should have. I, I, I um, was actually in an advert when I was 16. Really? Yeah, so um, it was for London schools where they were celebrating like people who are in some like arts and crafts or some type of creativity. So I was a saxophone player. And so, of course, yeah, yeah. And um, there's pictures of me like during the time, there's pictures of me like all over the tube, like everywhere. And I thought it was this amazing experience. And the agency who'd done the work were called Leo Bennett. Yeah, yeah. And then I asked them, Oh, can I come into your offices to see what's going on? When they had a day there, and I was just loved it because I met like the teams, and one of them they had in their room like all of these games consoles. Loads of like goodies, loads of snacks, everything. I said, where'd you get all this from? They said, oh, our clients, they give it for free. I was like, okay, it is my new job. <laughs> this is what I want to get into. Because um, yeah, like you said, it's, it's such a cool way to actually see things tangible. And if you get the root the boards like in perpetuity, that's even more amazing. Yeah, so I'm a bit, I'm a bit disappointed you didn't get free pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Although probably, you know, the company in bought us would have probably bought the rights to the pizza. That well. is true. That is true. I that is definitely true. want to do that while I was then. <laughs> but then were there times where you're like, oh shit, the company might, other than the cash flow issues, or whether like, this might not happen, like a campaign that, that the client wasn't happy with? It's impossible to keep 100% of the clients happy. Yeah. I mean, there were some projects you'd, you'd take on and get, oh, it's a bit of money, mm -hmm. a bit of extra money that month because you're trying to make the numbers and the team's going, we shouldn't take this. It's not the right project for us. We're not so good at this stuff. And we go, no, take it. Just take it this money. <laughs> and then you say, you go, I know you were right. Yeah. We shouldn't have taken that. It's just pain. How do you deal with unhappy clients? You just got to be honest. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know. Just for that, this was your brief. Yeah, it depends why they're unhappy. I mean, sometimes clients can be unreasonable too. Yeah. Um, but if we were wrong, you have to, you have to say we were wrong. Do you refund the money as well? I I have done. If it wasn't, if I find we're right, or I help them find somebody to do it, or I mean, it didn't happen often, mm. but but it does it happen? I mean, it was the internet, right? And you know, things were, were moving quickly, and you're trying to keep up, but you're not always, you know, on point with a particular piece of technology. You take it on, or something changes. Sometimes clients don't read specifications, mm -hmm. and there, there's lots of lots of variables for, for things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. So exit happened. Did you stay with the company for a black like, earn out? Yeah, we did it. We, we did our earn out. It was about two years. Mm -hmm. And did it feel like a weight was lifted? Oh, no, no necessary weight lifted, but I guess you've gotten from leadership to another type of leadership and having bosses where you haven't had bosses for maybe like 10 years now or so. Um, how was that kind of change in autonomy? Um, the thing is, we, when we got bought, actually, we were still able to operate. They, they, look, they looked after the group. We worked with great people at the operating company at this end. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I don't think we ever, I certainly didn't ever feel that restricted. Yeah. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, they were good. They were very fair in how they dealt with us. Let's get on with stuff. Um, you know, we tried to win clients together and from that point of view, I think they as a global company at that time, it was a huge agency beast that we mm. went into. I think they weren't having the best time. Oh, just in general? Yeah, yeah. In, in, in their business, they lost a couple of big clients for the global clients. So, so I think from that point of view, they were going through a slightly tough time. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how they dealt, they were easy to deal with. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that, that two years, you know, we, we, Got some relationships that we made in that time that endure today. Sort of people that we still see and talk to, and yeah. So, so I think that it, it didn't feel too bad. But then, what happened? They then went and bought another like big ad agency, and all the then, and that felt the right time to because they that. Did you know what you were going to do next? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Yeah, I tried taking some time out. And I did a few projects, like for some friends, stuff like that, mm -hmm. which was fun, but I kind of didn't like being on my own Yeah, so much, like being in a team, mm -hmm. 
them with something. I mean, the kids were young, it was nice to have a little bit of time. Yeah. Still, so, um, yeah, I, I think that that time, I found myself sitting one day at the computer and I'd been there like doing some little things on my own for, for a few days in a row and I thought, yeah, that's not. So I think at that point I became open to kind of what next. Mm, did you have an idea of like the things that you were good at, the things that you enjoyed doing? And the people, well, you already knew the people you like to work with, not just yourself in a team, but things that you like doing and things that you're good at. Did you have a clear picture of that? No, I don't think I did. Really? I'm still not sure what I'm good at. <laughs> I think at that time, I was just open to ideas. I knew that I could, I suppose what I knew, I could, I'm okay with uncertainty and with trying new things. So I suppose I knew that, but, but what am I really good at? I, I still... Because I wanted, I, I understood how businesses scale, so I wanted to try something that's maybe a bit more scalable than mm -hmm. at least can get into it. So I suppose I, I went in thinking about what next with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And still within the tech world? Still within tech, or technology, and digital, yeah. whatever, whatever we call it these days. Mm -hmm. and it went from being World Wide Web into internet, into digital, into tech, I suppose, if anyone calls it now. So... Then you went from the agency um, world into, um, I think, student.com, right? Yeah, so, so my yeah. friends, they said, will you come, will you come and like, do a day a week to see somebody? And then kind of like, I ended up going to China like 10 days out of every 30 and building a commercial team in China. Cool. We knew that there were certain things going on because a, a lot of the clients, customers came from China, mm -hmm. massive number of students leave China and go and study in the UK, US. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was where the business actually started. A friend of mine set it up originally in China. Oh, like cool. Online student living. And so bought a domain, attached it to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I was de facto, I suppose, CMO, but involved in a lot of, well, how do you build a network of getting with all the education agents and, and building those relationships in China. Mm -hmm. How did you go about doing that? I hadn't just one amazing person. <laughs> but it took, me, it took me quite a long time to hire her. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was look, we've been looking for somebody who could really do that. Mm. I, I interviewed her over the course of about two days, met in Shanghai, and um, still a friend of mine today. Cool. And then you done my knees straight after that? Uh, I took... It took another like five, six months out. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been it'd been pretty full on for a while. N Norris and I had worked together. He he worked with me at the incubator, and then he came with us to Blue Barracuda. Mm -hmm. He set up the offshore operation. We've been friends since then. Wow! And when he had the idea for money, he approached me first. He said, Look, "I've got this idea. It's a word doc. Will you help?" You know, and I'm trying to do this. When have you got some money? And so I, I became the first investor, and was his, I suppose, his main advisor at that point. Mm -hmm. At the time, because when monies came in, I feel like they were one of the first. This is Neil Banks, right? Because um, I remember I used to do a little bit of um, personal finance blogging, and monies they had like the best blogs at that time about like traveling abroad, saving. How did you go about trying to create a business model? for these neo banks when at the time the main USP was customers not paying anything. How did you think about creating the business model for them to actually We'd always thought for? we'd always thought because we were providing access. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't it was never meant to I don't think it was ever going to be a bank as such. Mm -hmm. And banks are, are I suppose they're interest arbitrage businesses. Mm -hmm. But they're called, right? You get deposits in, you pay a certain percentage for that, you lend money out at a higher percentage from what's left in the middle is yours. Yeah. But we were, it was always going to be an e-money business because it was about access to the system for people who wouldn't otherwise have it. Got it. That was its reason for existing. Mm -hmm. So um, because of that, we always knew that we were going to charge for it. Okay. It, we didn't start off charging for it because we hadn't had, we thought we'd just launch it and then code that revenue model afterwards. 
Because mm-hmm. so, you're learning. Get, get the learning as, as quick as possible. Just to have that time. I mean, it, it launched no revenue model, Android only. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there were lots of bits. You know, as I say, they just launch, launch as fast as possible. And I think, I think what Norris and the team did with that was I mean, just, I mean, as rudimentary as hell. Yeah. But it worked. Just get it out. <laughs> get people using it. Mm-hmm. Learn from, from what they do. But it was, you know, in, in the, compared to, and, you know, you see most of the Neo banks did the same. Just get it out there in whatever form. I mean, Monzo, when it originally launched, was just an e money card. Yeah. Came a bank later. So coming into a bank, it's a very different experience from all the other things you were working on beforehand. Was there like a steep learning curve in terms of just trying to get your, get your feet under the desk and understand what is going on? In in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Because mm-hmm. it was, it was, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, there, there was. There was in terms of all that, all, all those acronyms and nomenclature. Um, but again, I think to a certain extent, some of the naivety helped because we didn't think it, you know, well, why isn't this possible and why can't we do this? And and so I think some of some of that is also healthy. But if you told me before Norris approached me with that idea that I'd find debit cards fascinating. <laughs> I'd have said you're crazy. It's it, you know, but but it was the thing that I loved about it is is that it was a business that was really trying to help people. Yeah. Yeah. That seems to be the core. Yeah, because now that I think about it, when you went it's like you yeah, your roles have been to do with like establishing or setting things up or scaling um japan then when you started blue barracuda then the vp business then the student the student.com business and then money is as well that seems to be a clear thing yeah i do i i, I definitely enjoy the earlier stages yeah when things get I, I, i'm less great when it becomes a bit more corporate mm-hmm. I've, i mean i've worked in big businesses and i enjoyed those roles but but yeah, I, I definitely like the early. It's my preference for how I spend my time. And what about it? Do you love it the most? Uh, I suppose you're just getting to m- make it up, explore things, make things happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How do you keep that sense of awe and like naivety, especially when you've seen what things can work, right? Because you've been with so many businesses and advised different businesses, you know what works. How do you keep that mind of naivety open for like new ideas? I just me and people all the time with interesting new things that I know mm-hmm. nothing about. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's really interesting. Like, if something like catches your attention, you you, you want you want to know more. Yeah. So so how do you how do you find you know, what's your process for finding that out? Mm-hmm. And I think that that's if you're meeting interesting people with great ideas all the time. Yeah. Um as long as you keep your curiosity, I think it's quite it's quite easy to right great well that's interesting wouldn't be <laughs> but then you get to the problem of you've got too many things you're doing <laughs> uh, yeah i suppose that there needs to be some in the end some balance mm. uh and you definitely there there's times you just haven't you have to focus a bit more and i'm i'm not so good at that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's when i really get into something i can but these days, I'm, you know, I, I do need to be brought. I have, I have a business partner, Nick, and he, he's got to go. No, no, he like get my head, <laughs> get a blinkers on. That sort of, sort of like, no, look, he, look, look at me, look at me. Now we're doing this. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so that that uh, I definitely need people to do to do that. So many things to do in the world. So many interesting things going on, and and I mean, I mean, amazing. Founders all the time, mm. and yeah, you know, oh, I hadn't thought about that. What well, about that that thing? Yeah, yeah. Has there been a time where you might have been against something, but someone was able to provide like a different alternative option? You didn't think it was, you didn't think it was going to work, but it actually turned out way better than you expected. Um, there's always what 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 I really like are the founders who challenge challenge my opinion. Is it? You know. It's only so much that, you know, I'm learning all the time. Yeah. And people go, well, 
are you that thing you said? Yeah, about that. Well, what about this and that? And they go, and I sit there and go, well, yeah. We should have thought before I spoke. <laughs> and I, I think that's really, I really love that. Yeah. I've got loads of great young pandas. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, well, can, well, I had one the other day. And I said, well, that idea about you've described it as that. And is it really about that? I don't I, I can't see that. And he gave me 10 reasons really quickly why I was wrong. Yeah. And he was, and he was absolutely right. He was in, he was in. And that happens all the time. So that, 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 that I like. I mean, Moniz is great. Moniz wasn't meant to be a big business, you know. Norris and the team turned into one. Because mm. you have a particular framework of like the startups that you decide to work with either as an investor, advisor, or just as a operator. Do I want to go on a journey with this founder? Mm. I mean, there's some business stuff to it as well. Do I think, it's, you know, there's all the things about market, but I've, I wouldn't say that my approach to that is scientific. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely more limbic brain mm -hmm. than sort of like real rational thought. I'm sure I'd, I'd come up with things later to post rationalize it. Mm -hmm. Like anything you do with it. So that, that thing about people who buy electronics. So 85% of electronics purchases, people read the reviews after they bought the product as well as before. That's one of those people, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll do it right yeah. again. Has, is this a good decision? Yeah, 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 yeah. As it's funny, but sometimes, when it's a big purchase, I'm not trying to look at the reviews just in case. <laughs> <laughs> because, oh, I'll be kicking myself. Um, I, yeah, I wonder if there's a thing where when you start looking at reviews, it opens up another brain inside of your brain yeah, when yeah, you start looking sure. at the negative stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've, got a, I've got a way of looking at reviews now anyway, just by, you feel off for like the least ones, you feel for the most recent, and just by skimming, you understand what things you can deal with. So if like with restaurants, I'm good with bad service. I'm not good with bad food. So that's when, if it's like a three and a half or a four star, but it's just bad in terms of service, that's fine, I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna eat there. But it's that, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's that low, and the service is good, but the food is awful, I'm not showing up. I'm not showing up. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a. Uh, yeah, um, with me, you know, yeah. I don't get to go out to restaurants that that often. Oh, uh, that's cool. What do you mean? You're probably hosting the dinner parties yourself. Yeah, not really working. You know, <laughs> kid, you know, going through GCSEs. It's just like, you know, mm -hmm. have you done yet that duck biology paper? Mm -hmm. And that, that's my life. Good thing because you've had like quite a um, full on working life, but at the same time, you've been able to have a successful family family life. How have you been able to kind of balance the two together? I have an amazing wife. Yeah. I mean, I, I learned to move on, but she's, um, you know, definitely in the early days of building the first business. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the decision we took together that I would do that. We, you know, someone described it to me once as, I couldn't, I couldn't have climbed the ladder if she wasn't holding the bottom really rock solid. Yeah. Um, and she just, she never in everything I had to do in the late night, whatever it took, she never, not once, mind, ever, never brought it up. Yeah. Because we decided to go on that journey together. Why are you, you know, no, why have you not left yet? Why have you, she knew what it took. And it's paid off. She you know, we're, we're still together. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly 30 years later, isn't it? That's a big congratulations. Works as well as it, as it ever has. She's amazing. Yeah. So I think that that definitely helps. Mm -hmm. um, but it was always, I mean, when running the agency, we always, one of the commitments we made to each other as co-founders, we would always take all our holiday mm -hmm. and allow each other, whoever was, you know, we take holiday at different times, but because of how hard we were working, it was always important that we got to do that. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that? Because sometimes there's that niggling feeling in the back of your head where it's a weekend, you're not working, but you feel you should be working. How do you try and control that emotion? Not always easy. And definitely there are those times, you know, I've had the laptop out way too many days on the odd holiday. Yeah. It's part, part of it. 
I mean, you, you've got to try and manage your way out of that a bit mm -hmm. as the business grows. You know, you would, I think, you know, my sister pointed that out to me, that the problems with you, if you've got a company of 50, 60 people and you're doing all the work on, you, you, there's, there's something wrong with how you trust your team mm -hmm. in that process. So you've got, it's up to you to change that. Mm -hmm. So, so then she was absolutely right in that. Yeah, yeah. But you've got the power. Well, if, if, if it's only on you mm -hmm. if you're not doing something about that. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a balance. It's not sometimes there's something urgent and people need you just, yeah, whatever. But balance is not, I don't think it's easy. But as long as you're continually working to, to try and create it. Mm -hmm then you will do well a good chunk of the time, sometimes more, sometimes less. Mm. So do you think things such as like work-life balance are important early in your career versus, than, versus later? So in a sense of being able to work hard, find the support that you need in the right places, but get ahead and then later on start solving for work life balance to a degree for me the trick has always been to find something to do for work that doesn't feel like work i mean sometimes it's going to but to, to find to find that thing that even if you're doing it what what i say is kind of like people have often said to me at, at, probably don't say it so much anymore but you know that oh you work really hard but i think Hard work is doing something you hate for an hour a day. Getting something that you love 12 hours a day, that's a privilege. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I suppose that's how I've that's how I've typically looked at it. And for you, the thing that you love is the problem solving. Yeah, problem solving. Even with the time. Growing, found it. Work, making something work yeah. for people. That that bit's been that's been I suppose pretty key. So so I think finding that thing for you, and I know this. You know, it's not it's not easy for everybody to find that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think if you if you if you can have that part of that in your brain about how do i get to that then it, it doesn't matter the hours that you do it could feel less like work yeah yeah is that some of the lessons that you impart to your like portfolio companies as well i do encourage balance you know try and try and make sure that they're looking after themselves yeah and you know, be I, I'm way more likely to, to be direct on how they're looking after themselves than how they're looking after the business. Do you ever have you ever thought about what your underlying motivation is and what success generally looks like for you? I like helping people. I suppose that's where the agency bit yeah. felt good and solving somebody's problems. So I think I think I like to do. I get I get great. I feel rewarded by seeing somebody do better, mm -hmm. I suppose. So I think a lot of it's about that. There's definitely the bit about creating a life for your family that that is a, that's easier than it would otherwise be if you didn't do the things that you did. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd be wrong if I was saying that that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a pretty big motivation. Um, A certain level of of financial success is is good. I think it's 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 probably less than some of you know the press would have us think. Mm -hmm. uh, what number do you think it is? Obviously, it's different for everybody. But what would your number be? I don't. I don't think I'd put a number on it. I mean, you know, we had no money growing up, mm -hmm. so you know, I'm um, way way away from being like <laughs> okay what what will be the thing it don't it doesn't have to be monetary it can be like an activity any adventure where you know you're like you've completed it if that makes sense for me it was always about choice of how to spend my time mm -hmm. being able to say no to stuff but don't when i have the choice not to have to do the thing because i have to do it for the money so what's next on the horizon for you, would you say? I'm always looking for great founders. 
yeah. we've got the we've got up and to the right and so we've got these dual businesses under this kind of one entity up and to the right is kind of startup education mm -hmm. so just helping founders through those earliest parts of the journey so we've got various things that we i'm teaching at the moment at virgin startups mm -hmm. oh nice which is great i'm loving that mm -hmm. um back to some teaching at lse so we're gradually just helping helping all kinds of founders through their journey is there a particular problem that you see over and over again that you want to hone in on there's lots of things a lot of it is about investment readiness mm -hmm. but all the underlying things that go with that about getting your business right yeah like we call it investment readiness so people think about that's pitch decks but there's a whole layer of thinking about well, what kind of capital am i getting how mm -hmm. much capital do i really need what type of business is this how am i going to run it how's it going to scale what really is my market and a whole set of problems that go with that feed into I suppose ultimate to a pitch deck and a fundraising process, mm -hmm. but are much more about how you're thinking about the type of business that you want to build and the journey you want to go on. But we also have we have a we have an M and A boutique advisory firm as well mm -hmm. called Endeavor. So we help people take our knowledge from having sold businesses. And Andy, one of my business partners, he's a lovely, brilliant genius at that stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're always got sort of two or three companies that we're taking through that process. No, oh, busy. So yeah, well, we do get, <laughs> we do get quite busy. And then Nick, who's the big brain of of the three of us, he leads the consulting arm. Mm -hmm. So we we work with growth stage businesses and some larger corporations. And again, going back, we still love that problem solving bit. If you could go back and speak to Marcus of two thousand and two, what would you tell him? Um. I talked to him about the different routes that there are in businesses and what that means for the decisions that you take mm -hmm. about what you're going to build and, and tried to help him make the right choice for him at that point. Would that choice be different from what's happened? I don't know. I don't know. It, I'm, I've loved the journey. Um, I think... I don't, I mean, I, I haven't asked the guys this specifically, but I, I, I think probably that agency business, mm -hmm. it, it might have felt more natural to me as a thing to do than to the other guys. Not that they didn't enjoy it, and they were certainly great at it, um, but I think I probably, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. So I don't, because it's part of brought me to where I am, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think I'd change it. I mean, maybe. Mm -hmm. So I've got some quick fire questions at yeah. you. Um, your last purchase under £100, which changed your life? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I've started doing exercises with pieces of TheraBand. They're essentially exercise bands, but you can make them, you cut them off a thing and oh, yes, different yes, length yes. Yeah, yeah. in different strengths and do that. And and doing that to build up certain, certain parts of the body that are otherwise hard to work on, like ankles, mm -hmm. stuff like that, that I think bought some different pair of bands off Amazon for about 20 quid. And I'm now doing exercise to strengthen ankles, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I'm still like running, like being an assistant referee at some <laughs> football games. And they, they, you know, they're 16, 17, going on 17, they can run. Yeah. So you've now got to actually run up and down the line properly. So I need to keep things strengthened. So that, that's probably the thing that's, that changed my life the most in recent months. Was a, was Keeping certain things strong that otherwise would, might be just like falling apart then. That makes sense. I, first time using Therabands, now that I think about it, was when I went to this Busio and um, I was having knee pain and my knee pain was being caused by weak hamstrings and tight hips. And so they gave me a Theraband to just do loads of different exercises. Within a week or two, like all my knee pain went. So yeah, I attest to that. Because everyone, no one's using their glutes anymore because everyone's yeah. sitting. Yeah. Everyone sits in the wrong way. Yeah. So your glutes go, and then that turns your knees in mm -hmm. and turns your feet in, mm -hmm. and then everything goes ding, 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 out of alignment from there. The body's all connected like that. It's crazy. It all starts, according to my chiropractor, it all starts with the feet. Yeah, fair, fair. Um, best book you've recommended? Best fiction or non fiction? I'm going to say both because I'm into fiction. Fiction, I'm a big John Irving fan. My favourite is, I still find it remarkable, A Prayer for Owen Meany. Okay. Just 
Uh, just, you can't explain it. You have to read it. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. And then nonfiction. Nonfiction. My best book. I still love a whole thing for an entrepreneur. The whole thing about hard things. Mm -hmm. I still love. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, where can people find you? Contact you. Send their pitch deck to you. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes it takes. I get a lot of incoming, so sometimes it takes me. I try and give response to everybody. Sometimes it will be. It can be up to three weeks, depending on what's going on. But I try and send something back to everybody. Okay, cool. Who's send any founder who's, who's got pitch deck? Even if it's just a, sorry, I, I can't have time for it for now. Mm -hmm. I'll always try and get back. Cool. Thank you, Marcus. It's been a pleasure. Always, mate. Thank you.